It is time for the long awaited deep dive into race and IQ that we've been working on. A lot of time has gone into this. Producer Noah Ferguson has done some great research and editing, and this is exactly the type of work that we can do more of the more support we have from you. So with no further ado, remember membership Patreon. If you like this type of detailed video and audio investigation, Please continue supporting us and let's get right into part one of race and IQ today. The topic of race and intelligence can be sort of uncomfortable to discuss for a lot of people, and it's a subject that's very often steeped in identity politics. There's a lot of people on the left who don't want to touch the issue, or at least they don't want to have a conversation about the fact that, yes, certain races do score higher or lower on IQ tests. But then there's many on the right who want to use IQ tests to make false claims about genetics and other matters. It is true that in the United States, white people as defined on average score higher on IQ tests than Hispanic people and black people. And it's also true that Asian Americans on average score higher than white Americans on IQ tests. But the key is not to misinterpret this information to take IQ scores and conclude that some races are genetically more intelligent than others, you have to rely on several false assumptions. Just looking at IQ test scores does not tell us that certain races are genetically smarter than others for a number of different reasons. IQ is not an objective measure of innate general intelligence. Intelligence is complicated and intelligence manifests in a number of ways, linguistic skills, logical and mathematical skills, spatial reasoning, introspective skills, interpersonal skills, kinesthetic skills. Most aspects of intelligence are just not tested for on IQ tests. So intelligence manifests in a number of ways, but biologically, Intelligence itself is also not a unified genetic trait that we can even discuss as a single phenomenon with a single genetic driver. There's another major problem with trying to link race and intelligence, which is that race as a biological construct is not something that can be defined concretely and specifically enough, and thus you can't really measure it against other genetic traits like intelligence. There simply aren't enough genetic similarities within races to tie an entire race to a small set of genetic traits like intelligence. The concept of race is essentially meaningless in biology, and thus race is meaningless as an independent variable in studies about intelligence and genetics. But even when we are just talking about IQ, there's a lot of data out there suggesting that IQ is largely based on environmental factors during a person's development. IQ tests don't measure innate intellectual capacity. They measure certain obtained intellectual skills that are more common among certain social groups. And as we'll discuss, higher socioeconomic status causes higher IQ because higher socioeconomic environments foster the skills that are actually measured by IQ tests. Many people simply claim that certain races are just less intelligent because they're genetically born with less intelligence. And it's easy to shut down debate about race and intelligence with accusations of racism. It's easy to stigmatize people and their claims about race and intelligence simply by calling them bigots. But alleging racism isn't the same as proving that an argument is fallacious or that the data have been misused. Having a moral objection to someone's assertions about race and IQ is one thing. And sometimes those moral objections are justified because some people really are just racist. But proving someone wrong requires us to examine the facts. And I would like to do exactly that. Let's start with the brief history of attempts to tie race with genetic intelligence. For centuries, many white researchers have been eager to prove the intellectual superiority of white people, and they've used any number of non-scientific means. For the 18th and 19th centuries, before modern standardized intelligence testing, we saw researchers making assumptions about intelligence differences between races based on primitive and totally absurd means of testing, like measuring skull and brain size, measuring cranial volume to make racial claims about intelligence was total pseudoscience practiced by prominent scientists like Dutch physician Petrus Camper and American anthropologist Samuel George Morton. Measuring a dead person's skull 
can tell you something about the size of their brain, but not about their intelligence. And in fact, excess brain tissue is linked to a number of neurological disorders. In 1913, at the dawn of standardized intelligence testing, prominent American psychologist and eugenicist Henry Goddard established a written intelligence test at Ellis Island. Not only has this test been shown to have put ethnic minorities at Ellis Island at a disadvantage, it was later discovered that the only sub Subjects being chosen to even take the test were immigrants who were already suspected to have lower intelligence. This testing program reported that 87% of Russians, 83% of Jews, 80% of Hungarians, and 79% of Italians were, quote, feeble minded and had a, quote, mental age younger than 12. And Goddard's test had real world effects. The reporting from these tests directly influenced Congress's passing of the Immigration Act of 1924, which essentially ended Ellis Island as an immigration hub and drastically limited immigration into the United States in general. Another prominent figure in the early days of intelligence testing was English psychologist and Nazi sympathizer Raymond Cattell, who in the 1930s did research that concluded that the average British IQ was going down because because of non-white immigration into Britain. His conclusions were eventually disproved by what we know today, which is that the IQ of most human populations has actually been increasing since the beginning of the 20th century. But regardless, Cattell's work was extremely influential and he used his research to loudly advocate against the mixing of races. And then we come to American physicist William Shockley, who became famous as an outspoken proponent of eugenics, starting with his address to the 1965 Nobel conference, where he said that non-whites were causing the, quote, genetic deterioration of humans. Shockley's findings have since been debunked again by the consensus today that human intelligence is constantly improving around the world. Shockley spent much of his career throughout the 20th century arguing that blacks are intellectually inferior to whites because of genetics and that we should not try to remedy this through education. He said instead we should just try to limit the birth rates of non-white people by using contraception and sterilization. Shockley said that individuals with IQs lower than 100 should be sterilized. Our discussion of William Shockley makes it necessary for me to bring up an institution that has played an important role in studying and advocating for eugenics in the 20th century. A great deal of Shockley's writings and lectures were funded by an American nonprofit organization called the Pioneer Fund, which was founded in 1937 with the goal of achieving what they called race betterment through promoting the genes of white people. Back then and still to this day, the Pioneer Fund has primarily existed to fund eugenic studies. The Pioneer Fund has ties to Nazi Germany during the 1930s and 40s. And for the last 60 years, they've been funding the International Association for the Advancement of Eugenics and Ethnology, which is an organization that promotes racial segregation. They've given over a million dollars to eugenicist Arthur Jensen, who's known as the father of modern academic racism. One of the Pioneer Fund's biggest beneficiaries over the last 20 years has been eugenicist Roger Pearson, who spent his career working with neo-Nazis to advocate for the superiority of the so-called Aryan race. Recent Pioneer Fund grantees have included white supremacists like Jared Taylor, as well as several organizations listed as racist hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And here's something very interesting. The Pioneer Fund has also given money to a group called the Federation for American Immigration Reform, which is an organization with ties to white supremacy. Several of that organization's high highest ranking employees now work at the White House. Whenever there are people painstakingly conducting what sometimes may appear to be objective research to prove the superiority of white people or people in government trying to shape policy based on an agenda that non whites are harmful to society, there is often an organization like the Pioneer Fund quietly looming in the background, providing funding somewhere down the line. And no discussion about race and intelligence would be complete without mentioning what's probably the most well known book ever published on the subject, the 1994 book written by political scientist Charles Murray and psychologist Richard Ernstein called 
the bell curve. The bell curve is widely thought of as a work of pop science because it was aimed at a general public audience. It was not submitted for peer review before publication. It wasn't even allowed to be circulated among book reviewers before being published, like most nonfiction books are. But the book created a huge stir in popular culture when it was published in 1994. And the bell curve is one of the most commonly cited books today by modern white supremacists and eugenicists. Although it was published 23 years ago, the book has seen somewhat of a revival in sales over the past few years with the rise of the alt right and author Charles Murray's recent college speaking gigs. The book tries to bring back to life a bunch of theories about race and IQ that have long been discredited. And some of the book's central claims are that IQ tests are the best measures of cognitive ability, that IQ tests aren't biased against any economic, ethnic or racial groups, that non Hispanic white Americans are naturally more intelligent than black and Hispanic Americans, that IQ has more of an impact on someone's success in life than their childhood socioeconomic status and environmental factors, and that IQ IQ in the US is declining because we're allowing too many low IQ people, in other words, non white people, to immigrate to the United States. The bell curve's conclusions about race and IQ largely draw from studies by 13 researchers. And these studies cited in the book were funded by, guess who? The Pioneer Fund. Again, the Pioneer Fund is a nonprofit that promotes eugenics and has direct ties to white supremacists. Several times, the bell curve cites studies conducted by J. Philippe Rushton, who for many years was the head of the Pioneer Fund. Rushton has said that black people are biologically predisposed to break the law, have lower intelligence and are more impulsive. Rushton once said, quote, blacks have an advantage in sport because they have narrower hips, but they have narrower hips because they have smaller brains. Rushton has also said that intelligence has an inverse correlation with penis size. J. Philippe Rushton's research has been universally dismissed by the scientific community because of its flaws and biases. But these are the kind of people whose research is used in Murray's The Bell Curve. But we have to remember that the claims made in The Bell Curve aren't wrong because of the motivations of the authors and the researchers that are cited. The Bell Curve has problems because it doesn't stand up scientifically. The book drew so much attention when it was published that the following year, the American Psychological Association commissioned a report report by 11 leading intelligence experts to address the claims made in the book. The report was called Intelligence Knowns and Unknowns. The APA said that the bell curve created serious misunderstandings and that there was urgent need for an authoritative report on these issues, one that all sides could use as a basis for discussion. In this report, in the response to the bell curve, the APA said there is certainly no such support for a genetic interpretation. It is sometimes suggested that the black white differential in psychometric intelligence is partly due to genetic differences. There is not much direct evidence on this point, but what little there is fails to support the genetic hypothesis. And it shouldn't be any surprise that neither of the bell curves authors actually worked in biology or any hard science. There's a mountain of scholarship directly debunking the claims made in the bell curve. The APA, along with a multitude of intelligence experts, have agreed that the bell curve, like most other modern attempts to link genetic intelligence to race, rely on a few fundamental assumptions that are just not supported by science. One, that there must be enough genetic differences between races and enough genetic similarities within races to biologically tie intelligence to race, that IQ test scores must be synonymous with general intelligence and innate intelligence, and that intelligence must be primarily based on genetics and not on environment. Let's start with the first false assertion that it's legitimate to even have a conversation about genetic intelligence in terms of race. The truth is trying to figure out the average genetic intelligence of different races is essentially arbitrary and meaningless. First of all, over time, there have been countless definitions of race. People throughout history have divided humans into races in many different ways. And even today, different people in different parts of the world use varying definitions when they're talking about race. For instance, are people from India and people from Japan part of the same race? What about people from Spain and people from Russia? You're going to get different answers to those questions in different contexts. But even in the way we talk about race today in the US, things don't have that much biological basis. Let's say that some examples we accept of races are white, 
black, maybe East Asian, maybe Native American. These labels have a lot of important social significance, which is why the idea of race is valid when we're talking about the census or political polls. But there is no such thing as race in genetics and biology. So studies that examine correlations between genetic race and innate intelligence are inherently flawed from the get go. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization declared as early as 1950 that there is no such thing as race in biology based on the findings of an international panel of leading anthropologists, geneticists, sociologists and psychologists. And this is still the scientific consensus today, supported by the National Institutes of Health, the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association and the American Anthropological Association. In the study of genetics, there is no way to break humans up into races. Now, that is not to say that there isn't genetic variation between human populations. There obviously is. But race is biologically not a definable construct. There is no white gene or black gene. There is no one gene that all people from a given race have. In genetics, there is no such thing as blackness or whiteness. Genetic variation is fluid. It's possible to use DNA to figure out where someone comes from geographically with some accuracy. But no one who believes in genetic races is able to accurately tell us which genes should be tested to determine someone's race. People subjectively make social distinctions about race based on things like skin color, hair and eye shape, which are based in genetics. But the crucial thing to understand is that those traits don't predict everything else about a person's entire genetic makeup. Someone's skin color doesn't necessarily tell you whether or not they're going to have dimples or whether or not color blindness runs in their family. Skin color also doesn't tell you anything about a person's intelligence. So maybe you're thinking, well, hold on. Certain races are more susceptible to certain diseases. So why can't certain races be smarter than others? Here's one example. There's this common misconception that black people, people with African heritage as a race are genetically inclined to get sickle cell anemia. Not exactly true. The misconception goes like this. Skin color is inherited and sickle cell disease is inherited. Therefore, sickle cell disease is caused by race. Susceptibility to sickle cell is a response to a certain population being exposed to malaria for a long period of time over many generations. And malaria is only rampant in certain parts of Africa. So only people of African descent that come from certain parts of Africa have the gene for sickle cell, not all black people. And by the way, there has also historically been a lot of malaria in southern Europe, the Middle East and South Asia and populations from those regions also have the sickle cell gene. It's not a black phenomenon. Humans can be split up into separate populations that have significantly similar genetics. But these populations are confined to relatively small geographical regions. For example, two people with 100 percent of their genetic heritage coming from the same village in Eastern Europe many generations ago are likely to have significant genetic similarities. But when you compare those people with someone of Scottish genetic heritage, there end up being far fewer genetic similarities. So even though a fully Eastern European person and a fully Scottish person both appear to be white, and in many cases, these two people may be ethnically indistinguishable in their appearance, it's useless to lump them into the same category as white in order to test for other outcomes like intelligence. We don't yet know which genes are associated with intelligence, but we can't assume that whatever genetics are manifesting make them both appear white are also tied in with all other genetic traits they may have, like their intelligence. There are just not enough genetic similarities within what we refer to as a race to make assumptions about other aspects of a person's genetics. There is even huge genetic variation within local regions like Scandinavia or the Iberian Peninsula or Southeast Asia. There are several thousand genetically similar human populations on Earth. You have to go to a very micro level geographically to find humans with significant genetic similarities. And 85 percent of human genetic variation takes place within these tiny individual populations. So even comparing these small local populations wouldn't necessarily give us any useful data about intelligence, much less comparing people by continent.
classifying all of these thousands of groups in order to further test for outcomes like intelligence in a meaningful way would be really difficult. But it's especially meaningless to report findings about a very specific set of genetic traits like intelligence in relation to someone's skin color or continent of origin. And biologically measuring anything in terms of race is especially problematic in the Western Hemisphere because it's so common for people's genetics to have a multitude of geographical origins, even though people socially identify with a particular race. If someone in the U.S. is five eighths black and three eighths white, they will probably, for social reasons, identify as black because they look like what we think of as a black person. So even if intelligence was tied to race, how would we know which intelligence genes are being expressed in that person? Are they manifesting the black intelligence or the white intelligence? Very few people in the U.S. can trace their ancestry back to a single place. The average African-American genome is 24 percent European. The average American Latino genome is 18 percent Native American, 65 percent European and 6 percent African. And where those genetics come from within those continents is also going to vary a lot. So when someone takes an IQ test and simply tells you their race, there are a ton of genetic variables that are just not being accounted for. Another big problem with using IQ tests to judge the average innate intelligence of different races is assuming that IQ is the same as a person's general intelligence. Like I said before, the idea of intelligence is very complex and it manifests in a number of different ways. It's like trying to measure if someone is a nice person. What are we really measuring? We shouldn't discount IQ tests wholesale because IQ tests are good at measuring what it is that they measure. But the important thing is not to misinterpret IQ. There's a common misconception that IQ is a measure of someone's overall intelligence that they're born with. That is not what IQ is. And any intelligence expert will tell you that a person's general intelligence can't be summed up by one number. IQ tests measure only a set of specific skills, and these skills have to be acquired. All IQ tests measure is a person's ability to perform particular cognitive tasks like reading comprehension, a person's ability to work with analogies and do other certain analytical tasks and to measure what kind of vocabulary they have. That's a pretty narrow range of what we could consider to be intelligence and whether it even measures any aspects of intelligence is questionable, depending on whether you define intelligence as someone's potential to perform or someone's actual performance. But humans aren't just blank slates at birth. We don't all have the same amount of potential to learn those skills and have higher IQs. Some people are born with biological predispositions to better learn the skills that IQ measures. But after you're born, your acquisition of those skills is mostly determined by your environment, which accounts for most of your IQ. We don't know what the limits of what a person's IQ can be unless they have the right resources. And the phenomenon that the IQ scores of a particular person tend to remain more or less the same at different ages isn't evidence that IQ is innate and unchanging because of biology. This just shows what should be obvious, that a person's environmental conditions are likely to stay the same throughout their development. And many studies have shown that intervening in a child's development with cognitive skills training will raise their IQ. And that is because higher IQs are correlated with better access to resources that foster those cognitive skills. And those resources are more present in the lives of children of higher socioeconomic status. There can be a huge difference between what someone is capable of due to their biological disposition and what skills they obtain because of their environment. A French study published in the journal Nature observed siblings adopted by families of contrasting economic status. They tracked children who had the same biological parents but were adopted and raised from an early age by different families, and they took into account those adoptive families' education, occupations, and income. The study found that being raised in a high socioeconomic status home can boost IQ 12 to 16 points. By the way, that also happens to be the approximate IQ difference between the average white person and the average black person.
Psychologist Eric Turkheimer conducted a similar study, but assessed twins who were adopted into different families so that the children's genetic makeup would be 100 percent the same. The study found that the heritability of IQ among children raised by families of low socioeconomic status was only around 10 percent and a little higher in more affluent families. This suggests that while, yeah, IQ can be inherited from parent to child to some degree, children are less able able to benefit from their genetics if they're raised in a lower socioeconomic environment, which is to say, if you're a rich kid, you're going to have plenty of educational opportunities and your IQ is more likely to just be what it is, whether high or low. But if you have fewer educational opportunities, your IQ is much more likely to suffer from that. But like I said before, even though some of your IQ can be linked to genetics, there's no meaningful way to relate that to race because there is an incredible huge amount of genetic variation inside races. But anyway, if IQ tests are evaluating people of drastically different upbringings and environments, then their inherent intelligence is not being assessed in a vacuum. Instead, IQ test scores are just derived from a number of variables that are hard to measure everything from a person's home life during their development to the quality of their education to whether or not they have attention deficit issues to their actual motivation to do well on the test itself. And skills measured on an IQ test are not valued, taught or used across all groups of people to the same degree. If you take someone who came from a lower socioeconomic class and had less access to quality early childhood education, they are likely to score lower on an IQ test. Let's take two people who were born with the same level of innate intelligence at birth. One of them is an American with great access to quality American education throughout their development, and the other lives in a tribal community who had to learn an entirely different set of skills to survive and succeed in their society. Which of these two people do you think would score better on an IQ test? IQ tests largely measure a person's ability to think abstractly and use theoretical analysis. But if a child isn't immersed in that type of thinking during their development, they're not going to learn as many of those skills. American children are more likely to develop these skills than children in a third world country, and privileged white American children are more likely to develop these skills than a Hispanic American living in a low income neighborhood. And it's a cycle, right? Well educated people who make more money have children who are given more educational opportunities to develop these cognitive skills, and uneducated people with less money are more likely to raise children with that same lack of opportunity. Another thing, like I mentioned before, global IQs have been rising since the beginning of the 20th century. This is also evidence that IQ has more to do with environment than genetics. The scientific consensus is that IQs around the world have been rising at a much faster rate than could even possibly be explained by genetics. Human genes can't mutate that quickly. So this huge acceleration in IQ over the past hundred years is most likely due to globalization and dissemination of Western education. During that time, the skills assessed by IQ tests have become more necessary and nurtured in more parts of the world and in lower socioeconomic echelons. And so understandably, guess who has seen the biggest leaps in IQ over the past hundred years? Non-whites and marginalized ethnicities within different societies, all of which supports what we know about IQ being more affected by environment than genetics. So to sum up, Race isn't even a valid context to begin with when you're talking about biology and IQ tests are not the be all end all of measuring intelligence. But even when we are just talking about IQ, there is evidence that genetics can determine IQ to some degree. But there is conclusive evidence that environment plays a bigger role in determining IQ. Assumptions we make about groups of people have real world consequences. The way we see people as groups and as individuals should be rooted in fact. And even though racial differences in IQ are grounded mostly on environment, having prejudices about certain races is still racism. One irony is that people on the right supposedly espouse the ideas of individualism and personhood, yet they are usually the ones who want to make these false judgments about groups of people and make fallacious claims about race and IQ. Another irony 
is that people on the right are the people who say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But it's usually people on the right who perpetuate these inaccurate narratives about certain races being genetically destined to be less intelligent and less successful. The most important thing is that an individual's race can't tell you anything about their intelligence or their character. And human beings should be judged on qualities other than their IQ. But there is certainly no current scientific proof indicating that there are differences in genetic innate intelligence between the social lines that we call race.